Chapter 11, Section 4. Does natural law actually provide protection for individual liberty? Well, but it seems fair to ask. I mean, does natural law actually respect individuals and their rights, like, i.e. liberty? I mean, I think no. I think not, at least. So you're probably asking why at this point, right? Well, according to Rothbard, the natural law ethic states that for man, goodness or badness can be determined by what fulfills or thwarts what is best for man's nature. Ethics of Liberty, page 10. But, of course, what may be good for man may be decidedly bad for man or woman or NB. If we take the, uh, the example of the soul oasis in the desert, see chapter 4, section 2. Then, according to Rothbard, the property owner having the power of life and death over others is good. While if the dispossessed revolt and refuse to recognize their property, this is bad. In other words, Rothbard's natural law is good for some people, namely property owners, while it can be bad for others, namely the working class. In more general terms, this means that a system which results in extensive hierarchy, i.e. archy or power, is good, even though it restricts liberty for the many, while attempts to remove the power, such as revolution or the democratization of property rights, is bad. Well, that feels like a very strange logic. However, such a position fails to understand why anarchists consider coercion to be wrong or unethical. Coercion is wrong because it subjects the individual uh, to the will of another. It's clear that the victim of coercion is lacking the freedom that the philosopher uh, Isaiah Berlin describes in, well, the following terms. I wish my life and decisions to depend on myself, not on external forces of whatever kind. I wish to be an instrument of my own, not of other men's acts of will. I wish to be a subject, not an object, to be moved by reasons, by conscious principles, which are my own, not by causes which affect me, as it were, from the outside. I wish to be somebody, not nobody, a doer, deciding, not being decided for, self-directed, and not acted upon by external nature or by other means, as if I were a thing or an animal or a slave incapable of playing a human role, that is, of conceiving goals and policies of my own and realizing them. Four Essays on Liberty, page 131. Or, as Alan Hayworth points out, We have to view coercion as a violation of what Berlin calls positive freedom, anti-libertarianism, page 48. Thus, if a system results in the violation of positive liberty by its very nature, namely, subject a class of people to the will of another class, the worker is subject to the will of their boss and is turned into an order taker, then it's justified to end that system. Yes, it is coercion. uh, uh, Yes, it is coercion that has dispossessed the property owner, but coercion exists only for as long as they desire to exercise power over others. In other words, it's not domination to remove domination. Remember, it is the domination that exists in coercion which fuels anarchist hatred of it. Thus, coercion to free ourselves from domination is a necessary evil in order to stop far greater evils occurring, as for example in the clear-cut case of the Oasis Monopolizer. Perhaps it will be argued that domination is only bad when it's involuntary, which means that it's only the involuntary nature of coercion that makes it bad, not the domination it involves. By this argument, wage slavery is not domination, as workers voluntarily agree to work for a capitalist. After all, no one puts a gun to their head, and any attempt to overthrow a capitalist domination is coercion and so wrong. However, this argument ignores the fact that circumstances force workers to sell their liberty and so violence on behalf of the property owners is not usually required. Market forces ensure that physical force is purely defensive in nature, and I already argued that in Chapter 2, Section 2, that even Rothbard recognized that the economic power associated with one class of people being dispossessed and another empowered by this fact results in relations of domination, which cannot be considered voluntary by any stretch of the imagination, although, of course, Rothbard refuses to see the economic power associated with capitalism when it's capitalism he can't see the wood for the trees and of course i'm continuing to ignore the fact that capitalism was created by extensive use of coercion and violence see chapter eight thus natural law 
and attempts to protect individual rights and liberty, see a world in which people are free to shape their own lives are fatally flawed if they don't recognize that private property is incompatible with these goals. This is because the, ex the existence of capitalist property smuggles in power and so domination, the restriction of liberty, the conversion of some into order givers and many into order takers. And so natural law does not fulfill its promise that each person is free to pursue their own goals. The unqualified right of property will lead to the domination and degradation of large numbers of people, as the Oasis Monopolizer so graphically illustrates. And again, I stress that anarchists have no desire to harm individuals, only change in institutions. If a workplace is taken over by its workers, the owners should not be harmed physically. If the OS is, t is taken from the monopolizer, the ex-monopolizer becomes like all other users of the Oasis, although <laughs> probably very much disliked by the others. Thus, anarchists desire to treat people as fairly as possible and not to replace one form of coercion and domination with another. Individuals must never be treated as abstractions. If they have power over you, destroy what creates the relation of domination, not the individual. And if this power can be removed without resorting to force, so much the better. A point which social and individualist anarchists disagree on, namely whether capitalism can be reformed away or not, comes directly from this position. As the individualists think it can, they oppose the use of force. Most social anarchists think it cannot, and so many support revolution. This argument may be considered as utilitarian, the greatest good for the greatest number sort of territory, and so treats people not as an end in themselves, but as a means to an end. Thus, it could be argued natural law is required to ensure that all, as opposed to some or many or the majority of individuals are free and have their rights protected. However, it is clear that natural law can easily result in a minority having their freedom and rights uh, respected, while the majority are forced by circumstances created by the rights laws produced by applying natural laws, we must note, to sell their liberty and rights in order to survive. If it is wrong to treat anyone as a means to an end, then it is equally wrong to support a theory or economic system that results in people having to negate themselves in order to live. A respect for persons to treat them as an ends and never as a means is not compatible with private property. The simple fact is that there are no easy answers. We need to weigh up our options and think on what we think is best. Yes, subjectivism lacks the elegance and simplicity of natural law, but it reflects real life and freedom far better. All in all, we must always remember what is good for man need not be good for people. Natural law fails to do this and as such stands condemned.